from our eye. We welcome the internet. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse um, 1. Ephesians 4, 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, time, the time when Paul's imprisoned, so this is what they call the prison epistles, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherever you're called. And if in this study, number one, you should figure out what your vocation is or you could never walk worthy of it, and you're called, and that vocation's been part of that calling. And so uh, if you don't know your vocation, and uh, it, it's a lot simpler when you first start out the basics. Women, uh, you love your husbands. Husbands, you love your wives. Uh, but that's not your vocation. That's just your way of living. Look in uh, Paul's writings and see what your vocation would possibly be. I think a lot of people, and, and don't get upset with me, and this is not because I'm going to pass the plate or anything, but most people forget that giving is part of your vocation. There's no doubt about that. Uh, it's called fruit, and it's a vocation that if you do it cheerfully, there will be a reward based on that part. Not all people are called to be preachers and pastors and teachers and, and apostles and whatever, but you must be called for something. Or he wouldn't write the verse, right? Would he write the verse if you're not called with a vocation? Yay or nay? No. Uh, does it have a walk involved? Okay, verse 2. This is how you walk in that vocation, with all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. Now that the first part we want to discuss is the unity, and we'll use that word right there, and then we'll have spirit, and then we'll have faith in another verse. Okay? Walk in the unity, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. So this first verse, verse 3, has an endurance it's something that you have to accomplish daily. It's something that you have to do, and it's to keep something. You with me? Is that what the verse says? Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So we must find out what this is based on, and then go with me to verse 13. Till, so between these probably is a, Till, verse 13, till we all come in the unity of what? So there's the faith. So you have the unity of the spirit and you have the unity of the faith. And this is being endeavored to keep so that this will come about. Are you with me so far? Now watch. Verse 4, there is one body. Okay? The bond of peace is based on 4, 5, and 6. There is one body, one spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. Okay? So the bond of peace is based on verse 4, 5, and 6. Oneness. Uh, how do you unite everything in one? Well, you endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit, so you have to find out what the unity of the Spirit is. Then you have to understand what the unity of the faith is based on, and so that the bond of peace holds it all together. And there's an endeavoring, like I said, and it based on walk according to the vocation, wherever you're called, Okay. Uh, there's a lot of warnings in Paul's writing, a lot of warnings in the Bible, not to help people that cause divisions, offenses, contrary to the doctrine which you have learned. Uh, I do not support, nor do I even listen to, in that sense, people that lie or do not talk about the truth. 
there's no sense. If they're not talking about the truth of the Bible, if they're not giving the gospel of Christ, then I am not going to be a follower of it or support them. I will not support them. And I check people out before I even think about it. And I have quit certain uh, missionaries and other people through the years because they didn't stand for the truth. So you have to look, you have to search and see what you're supporting, what you're doing, what your vocation is your vocation in line with what God wanted you to do, and on and on. Okay, now watch. Verse 7. But unto every one of us is given grace. Now, why is the grace given? What is the context of the first six verses? Do you have a vocation? Okay. Hold here just a second. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I apologize. 2 Corinthians 9. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse, now I'm going to read this verse. You tell me if you really like this verse. Verse 9, uh, verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Do you like that verse? The verse is used commonly, especially among grace people. It is a common known verse. Most people can quote it almost. Uh, when I say most people, most people that do use it. So, Agreements. Do we like the verse? Do you want to walk thinking that God is able to make all grace abound towards you? Did you read the verses before and after? Rot roll. Now, look in verse 6. But this I say, he that soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. If Harold cuts down on the seed that Levi's allowed to plant, then Levi should not expect to have a bigger harvest. Yes or no? If, he, if Levi's got a 40 acre field to plow and Harold only buys 20 acres of seed, is Levi supposed to get up one morning and tell MK, we're going to have a great harvest in that 40 acres? Did I miss you? Yes or no? He can't expect that. Okay? Verse 6, But this I say, He that soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. So what should Harold give him? Probably an excess of seed to make sure that the 40 gets plowed and gets planted fully. Correct? All right, let's read on. Verse 7, every man according to his purpose in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or necessity, for God loves what? And as he's cheerful, what will verse 8 happen? You can't take it out of context. That is not what you're supposed to do. And God is able to make all grace to weigh on you, being a cheerful giver, not one that holds on to George says you can have it if you can get it out of my hand I've had people like that believe me I had one woman that she wouldn't let go of it I had one man accuse me that I stole it from him and he handed it to me and then told me I stole it wow and I read on verse 9 parentheses as is written he that dispersed abroad he hath given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth forever. Now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. You see the context of saying, I mean, you claim some verses, you like them, but you better read around them to understand what he's talking about. Paul is very careful to write about giving, and that is one of the vocations. And most people miss that. And I mean, folks, I do a lot of traveling, and a lot of people expect me to get there on five dollars. That's the kind of offerings I get. Five dollars, ten dollars here, five dollars. 
and they expect me to be able to pay uh, gas, motels, and things like that. This is not what the message is about, but folks, there is a vocation that people better check out in their life. Say, well, you make all provision for everything else in your life, but you don't make provision for what the Lord is going to do for you. And God is not hindered because you're a slacker. God is not hindered because you're an abundant man. God is going to do what he's going to do, but you may lose out where you could have been part of. That's the key to it, and most people don't understand that. But now, go back with me in Ephesians, again, verse 8. Ephesians 4, 8. Oh, 7. But unto every man is given what? Well, then can he make all grace abound towards you? Is there a measure of grace? Then if God called you in a vocation, will he give you the grace to do your vocation? You think God would call you in a vocation and then cut you off? No. Okay? When I began to preach, I believe 2 Corinthians uh, chapter, uh, uh, apologize, 1 Corinthians 9, 14. For some reason, I was reading along there, and I said, Lord, do you really mean that? Now, ain't that stupid? To say to the Lord, do you really mean that? Come on, are you listening? I read 1 Corinthians, uh, go to 1 Corinthians, you, know, you understand, turn around Ephesians 4. I read it, and I said, Lord, Lord, do you really mean that? Oh, isn't that stupid to say something like that to the Lord? Lord, oh Lord, are you sure about that? Uh, do you really mean that? 1 Corinthians 9, 14. Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should what? I said, Lord, did you, did you really mean that? I mean, in this day and age. See, that's one of the questions that people say. In, oh, well, times have changed. This is a different age. No, it ain't. We're in the dispensation of what? Of grace. Then things are going to be done by grace. Until the body of Christ, which is the dispensation of grace, leaves, things are going to be done by grace. And I said, Lord, do you really mean that? And he hit me right in the face. He wouldn't have wrote it if he didn't mean it. He wouldn't have said it if he didn't mean it. So that's where the ministry I had began. So when I was out picking up beer cans to buy food, I said, Lord, I believe you've deceived me. No, he let me find the beer cans. I'm serious. Me and the girls used to get out on the road, pick up beer cans to sell to eat food because we wanted to preach the gospel in Mountain Home, Arkansas. And it began with one person coming, and then later on another person, then another person, and finally we had a fairly good-sized class. And the same people are there still today after many years. And all of them will tell you about the gospel of Christ. And we lived of the gospel. Why? What did God say? Is it ordained? It's ordained that they that preach the gospel should live of the gospel. So how do I go to these classes out here? Folks, I love you, but $200 a week don't pay traveling. You think it does, Harold? Not very far. I love you. I'm not asking you for more. I'm asking you to do your vocation. I'm not asking you for anything. I'm telling you that if people did their vocation, it'd be a lot easier. But God didn't say it'd be easy. I ain't got no complaints. You pay the house, you pay the air, you pay the rent. I ain't got no complaints. But as far as monetary, if they that I go to don't pay it, it has to come from God. And they lose their reward because they were not cheerful. Folks, don't be angry or upset that you give. Be cheerful. What is that the Jamaican said? Be happy. Why? What does God love? Did he, did he mean it? You said he meant 1 Corinthians 9, 14. Did he mean God loves a cheerful giver? Does he mean it? Well, yes. Well, then, he means this also in Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 6, uh, 8. Wherefore, he saith, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. He took captive people that were captive under sin and death. He led them up. 
And as it was, he placed us in heaven, knowing that there'd be a day in our life when we'd be born, a day in our life when we'd hear the truth, a day in our life when we would trust it, and he would seal us, and we are now in Christ, seated at the right hand of the Father. He led captivity captive, gave gifts unto men. Well, why did he give the gifts? How does faith come? And hearing by? Okay, let's read the verse, read on. Parentheses. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first in the lower parts of the earth? Oh my goodness, he did go into hell. Yay? Yay? Is hell in the tomb? Nope. Where is it? In the heart of the earth. Where did he go? Okay. He ascended for, uh, verse 10. He that descended, same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. Okay? So if there's all things, all right? Now, Jesus Christ had to die. He was buried. The tomb had him here, his body. Down here, his soul's in hell. And the day come when he got back in his body and his body ascended to the Father. Okay? Now, everything that he did. Now, his life is the life of righteousness. Did he not do everything righteously? His ministry looks like a failure because when he dies, he has no clothes. He has nothing. We put great stock in how much things we have and our clothing and how we look and all that. Jesus Christ did not have a piece of clothing on him when he died on that cross. He had no place to lay his head. His life was not based on what he could accumulate. His life was based on saving you. That's what he was after. And so he had to defeat death. For he died because he was made sin, and then he died for our sins to defeat what we are going to get if he's not involved. We will die. Okay? So, if I read this verse again, in verse nine, uh, 10, He that descended, the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might what? So there's something that had to be filled, and it is the purpose of God. He's going to fulfill all, he's going to fill all things, right? Now let's read on. Verse 11. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. All right? Go back with me to verse 8. Wherefore he said, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Skip the parentheses of verse 9 and 10. I'm going to read 8, and then I'm going to go to 11. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Verse 11, he gave some what? Some apostles. Is Paul and Barnabas apostles. Okay. He gave some apostles, some prophets. Did they prophesy during the book of Acts? Yes, they did. Some what? Timothy was an evangelist, one of them, and there's probably, I don't, I don't know all of them, some evangelists, some what? Pastors and teachers. So are they gifts? Did he give them? Okay. He done told them that they'd live with the gospel. They, if willing, how will they live? Of the gospel. Well, who's the gospel for? Body of Christ. Then what does the body do for the gifts? I'm trying to get you to understand something. If God gave you the gift, what will he allow you to do? Take care of the gift. Oh, somebody gives you a gift and right in front of them you tear it to pieces. Aren't you nice? They give you a gift. What do you do? If you like the gift, if it's something that needs to stand or something on your coffee table, you put it there and when people come in, you say, this is what
what God gave me, or what the person gave me, the gift they gave me. And you, you like it, and, and you look at it, and you say, that's really nice. Most people are so busy trying to run the preacher down because he said something against them. I have nothing good to say about you spiritually except in Christ. I all think you're wonderful. I think in grace, there are grace people are good. I, I praise God that you're here and, and I love you in the Lord. But you ain't worth the gunpowder to take to blow you into hell. You know, brother, more you say that, people, it's true. Are you wretched? Are you ungodly sinners and enemies? Are you having infirmity? Do you sin and come show the glory of God? But God interceded. And then when he did the intercession, you didn't know nothing about it. He let you be born. When he let you be born, he'd give gifts so that you could hear what God did for you. And he ordained, they live of it as they preach it. And he ordained that you had a vocation to walk worthy of, and you were the helps. That's in Corinthians. But we we're going to go on. All right. Why did he give the gifts in verse 12? Read what it says. This is a prison epistle. Is Paul in prison? Why did he bring this up just now? Why didn't he write this in the Roman letter? Who are the saints? Turn back to chapter 1. Let's read verse 1, Ephesians 1.1. 1, 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints which are where? And to... That's two different people, folks. Now let's see who they are in Ephesians 1.12. That we should be the praise of the Lord who first trusted in Christ. I wasn't one that first trusted in Christ. But the Ephesians of Acts 19 were. And you know what they had? They had ordinances. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Wouldn't I be silly to go to Harold's one, house one day and try to convince him to keep the ordinances? First, he'd say, what ordinances? So I'd have to lay out the ordinances which are written and delivered by Paul, and it's the letters, handwriting of ordinances. Things strangled, blood, fornication, things offered to idols. Which probably ain't even on Harold's mind. It, Harold, you think about that every day. Oh, God, I can't go to eat Chinese food. Buddha's been there. You're not worried about blood, are you? No. Strangle? Hell, I'm not even sure about strangle. You ever strangle a cow with your hand? Be pretty tough, ain't it? That'd be a little rough. <laughs> strangle, you go back in the Old Testament, it's rough to find. The blood thing, the Romans took an ox up on a stairway, up on a box. They would cut his throat, people would walk under it and get blood on them. That was a sacrifice. Obviously, are they under the dominion of the Roman Empire? Then he's telling them Gentiles, the ordinances were delivered to, don't do that no more. Right? Is it called handwritten ordinances? Okay. Do you believe you should keep them? 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Be you follows me, even as all some of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things, and keep the eat what? Did God write that? Now what are you going to do? You just lied to me. You said you wasn't supposed to keep them. Did I do something wrong? Did you read that? Let's read it again. Now I praise you, brethren, that you keep, remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I deliver them. 
unto you. Uh, you don't even know what they are, do you? You don't even know where they came from, do you? Well, you know, that could be because you weren't the first saints that trusted Christ. Now, let's go to Colossians and see if you like this book. Folks, I lost my dear chiropractor, my adjuster. He adjusted my body to where my spinal cord worked right. Your spinal cord gets pinched, or if it's out of position with the bones, you do not operate right. A lot of people bring a lot, bring a lot of problems, blame all their problems on a lot of other things when it's usually your spine. Because your spine, all your nerves flow through it. Pinch a nerve off, and guess what happens? Something's going to tell you about it, right? Uh, Colossians chapter 2, and go back to Ephesians, and let's look at these gifts before I read Colossians 2. Ephesians 1 again, a uh, 4. Now, did he give gifts? Or are they men? Correct? And he's telling the, the Ephesians to walk worthy of their vocation. Whatever that vocation is, walk worthy of it. Because this is what God has done for you in giving gifts. Now, watch verse 12. For the perfecting of the saints. Perfecting is adjustment. The body of Christ had to be adjusted to where everything would flow right. It would flow out and flow right. And the body would continue on right for this. How many of the body did Christ die for? How many are in the body right now? Not all of them yet, are they? Or we wouldn't be here. Now you know what the word till means. Are you with me so far? The whole body has to be in unity together before it can leave. That's what the till is. The unity of the Spirit is how each member gets in the body till that happens. And then when they're all in the body, then the unity of the faith is accomplished. Now, am I making any sense to you? That's a difference in things, folks. Now watch again. For the perfecting of the saints. The saints were keeping what? Ordinances. Now, if that's so, turn to 2 Timothy and give me Colossians 2. Was Paul in prison when he wrote Tim, uh, Ephesians? He was, wasn't he? Okay. Was Paul in prison when he wrote Timothy? Yes. 2 Timothy. Chapter 2. Verse 7. Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. <coughs> Gee, I wish that I've read Paul. I, I ain't no tell how many times I've read Paul, and I still don't understand Ezekiel. How about you? You understand all the workings of Ezekiel? That's not what he said. Consider what I say. Are you with me? Consider what I say. Not Ezekiel. How about, do you understand the book of Acts? Or do you get a little turn around why he's doing this and why this is going out of way and... and 
in Acts 16, Paul uh, baptized the jailer, and uh, there's some men. Got, do you understand that when Christ sent him not to? But who wrote Acts? Luke. Did that verse say consider what Luke says? What did it say? Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding of all things. Understanding of what? What I say. How do I understand that I'm not supposed to keep the ordinance of 1 Corinthians 11 too? Could it be that if I consider what Paul says, I'll find out why I don't have to keep the ordinances? Isn't that fair? Verse 8, remember that Jesus Christ see today was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Verse 15, study. Is this going to come natural for Timothy or is he going to have to study? Okay, if you come into contact with somebody that can't tell you the difference between the ordinances and not keeping the ordinances, and they can't tell you the difference in certain things, you know what they haven't been doing? They ain't been studying. So what's my vocation in verse 15? Study to show... What? Thyself approved unto God. Will I stand before God if I rightly divide the word of truth? Stand before God approved. But will I stand now before you approved of God for what I do? I'm not going to you get this. If I actually do what verse 15 says and show you that you're not under ordinances, or those things they did in the Acts. You with me? Study to show thyself to prove unto God. And you learn. And you understand. Then the understanding is not darkened. Hold here just a minute. We'll come right back. Ephesians 4. Verse 17, Ephesians 4, 17. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their minds, having, give me the next word, the, the not understanding, folks. There's a the understanding. There's an understanding out there to be had. Having the understanding what? Dark. Being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. The understanding in considering what Paul says. Number one, Christ died for our sins. According to the scripture. And he was buried. And he rose again the third day according to scripture. If you trust that, God seals you. How will you understand you got sealed? Ephesians 1.13. How would you understand what that is? It's the gospel of your salvation of Ephesians 1.13. If you're sealed, what is he sealing you for? For the day of redemption. Ephesians 4.30. You realize how much knowledge is in Ephesians letter alone? It's the understanding. Now watch again. Hold Ephesians 4, go back to 2 Timothy. You don't believe that Paul's letters are the word of truth? Do you believe his letters are the word of truth? Okay. Timothy, this is what you need to do. I'm putting that in my own words. Timothy, this is what you got to do. He told him in verse 7, Consider what I say, and the Lord give the understanding of all things. He told him, Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. He told him in verse 15, Study, Timothy, to show thyself, Timothy, approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. What is the word of truth? And what Paul wrote. Look, I can't take verse 7 out of the context. What did it say? Consider what I say. 
is Paul's writings in the word of truth. What should Timothy do? He should study Paul, uh, Paul's letters, right? What should he do with them? Rightly divide them. Did I show you that at one point in Paul's ministry he had to keep ordinances? Did you read it? Did God mean it? Yes or no? You are all failures. You are not keeping the ordinances. Because I never taught you to. Then did I do what Paul said? Go back with me. Let's see. Colossians. How many of you were knowledgeable of the Colossian letter in religion? How many of you were knowledgeable of Paul? Okay, Colossians chapter 2. Verse 13, and you, being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision in your flesh, hath he quickened together with him all, and having forgiven you all trespasses. Somebody said, well, why did he put trespasses instead of sins? Well, he just said you were dead in sins and the uncircumcision in your heart, uh, of your uh, flesh. But he said he had forgiven you what? All trespasses. What were the Colossians doing? They were trespassing the ordinances. Let's see. Verse 14. Blotting out the handwriting of what? Then the faithful are forgiven too. To the saints and the faithful. Folks, that's not a just happened to be a verse. Turn to Colossians chapter 1 verse 2. To the saints and what? Did the saints keep the ordinances? Yeah. They were the ones who first trusted Christ. How about the faithful? Are you faithful? If you're faithful, it's because you got the message, right? How come you're not keeping the ordinances? Because if that was still in effect, you'd be trespassing them. But what did God tell Paul to write to the Colossians? That they were forgiven all what? And what were they trespassing? The ordinance. My gosh, folks, we can't take it out of reference. Turn to Colossians 2.14. Blotting out the handwriting orders that were against us which were contrary to us, took it out of the way, nailed it to his cross. Oh my goodness, we have an understanding. When Jesus Christ died, he died for our sins. Would they be later be ordinances written down? Yes. Did Paul deliver ordinances? In the delivery of the ordinances, still at the cross, they don't make any difference. Men make difference, folks. Men accuse you of this. Men accuse you of that. Men try to straighten you out in this. Men try to get you to live by this. Men try to get you to live by that. The Colossians trusted the Lord. They were sealed with that Holy Spirit promise. They were God Almighty's children. They were adopted children. And in doing so, they didn't give a flip about ordinances. And God wrote a letter through his gift, Paul, in prison because he was put in prison because he had enlightened the first trusters, the saints, that he was turning to the Gentiles. Boy, Acts 28, he said, Lo, I turn to the Gentiles, and I'm talking about People that didn't give a flip about Jews or ordinances or anything else. Don't you understand this is that church in Selma? This is the church that knows they're forgiven without works. This is the church that doesn't have any ordinances or rules and everything that the, all the churches do because... You see, the churches have rules of coming in and dressing and all kinds of things, and they don't even know what the original four ordinances were in the first place. I 
wonder what happened if you went to First Baptist and tell them, how come you're not keeping the four handwritten ordinances? Well, they're going to look at you and go, what have four handwritten ordinances? I said, the doctrine you're trying to promote, the people that followed that church had ordinances. Where do you get the liberty not to keep the ordinance? Folks, we have to understand why don't we don't do what we do. Now, why is it that you don't want to get baptized? Baptism is a work in the Bible. It's not an ordinance. It is a work in the Bible to be done. Are they not getting baptized in Acts chapter 2, 3, 4, and on down? Why is it you have a right to come in here and say, I don't need water baptism? Go back to Ephesians 4 and watch. And I apologize. Just before you go, Colossians 2, let's see what it says. Verse 16. Let no man therefore judge you in what? What in the world is he talking about? Verse 15. Having spoiled principalities and power, he made a show of them openly triumphing over them in it. That, that's the cross. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or respect the holy days, new moons or Sabbath days or eclipse or whatever else you got to do. Now think. What would somebody come in on the Colossians try to do? Judge them. And they didn't have to worry about it. Neither do you. You can drink whatever you want, eat whatever you want, do whatever you want. You don't have to worry about Easter, Christmas, or any other days. This wasn't given to you in the first place. You don't have to be a good Christian. You ain't. You don't have to be a good person. You ain't. You don't have to dress like a Christian and be a good Christian. You ain't. And you don't have to. You can sit at the table in your Bible study and people say, oh my God, look what they've done in that church. And you don't have to worry about it and let them judge you, it don't matter. Don't you understand, the Colossians did not have to worry about somebody judging them in ordinances. He just told them they're forgiven all trespasses. Am, am I missing you folks? If God tells you you're not subject to it, what are you not? Amen, praise God. You're not subject to it. I told you, if God says it, like I said, I, I said, Lord, do you mean that? And it hit me. What? What a dumb question. Of course, he meant or he wouldn't write it. Now what? Ephesians 4. What do you think the Colossians did when they read this letter? Having never seen Paul. I bet they had more smiles than you do on your face. You a bunch of fizzle fossils sitting there. Be happy. You're not subject to anything. And God gave gifts to let you know that. And he gave you a vocation to earn a reward. He gave you the grace to do your vocation. A measure of it to take care of your vocation. Somebody said, well, I just don't have it. Well, there's a woman in the Bible who gave her last mite and she didn't die. She got a meal out of it. Now watch. Ephesians 4. Verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints. Well, then the saints had to be adjusted to accept people that wouldn't keep the ordinances. Clear as a bell. Why? They did. Didn't they? Didn't the first believers have ordinances they kept? Then God is perfecting them. Why? Why? Because he's reaching out, he's taking away the ordinances, they're blotted out. And he's letting the gifts go to totally unworthy hearers. Explain to me why you should have got to hear. I'm sure you impressed God, right? 
Some people don't believe they have underarm stink. <laughs> Saw Seinfeld, and he's supposed to take his shoes off. He was in an oriental uh, fingernail place. And he said, I don't take my shoes off. I have foot odor. Well, you got an odor, and it ain't sweet smelling to God. We stench in the nostrils of a living God in what we've done in our life. There's none good, there's none that doeth good, there's none righteous, there's none that understand, there's none that doeth good at all. We're wretched, we have a vile body in an evil world. How in the world can God accept us? When Jesus Christ offered himself up, he was a sweet-smelling savor unto God, and oh my goodness, that's in Ephesians 5. When he hang on that cross, that sacrifice was a sweet-smelling savor in God's nose for you. It was God's sacrifice to clear you up. And when his son went to hell, he forgave you and raised him. Why would you ever be sad? Why wouldn't you walk according to your vocation cheerfully? Why wouldn't you be happy? Why? Because you've let the world get you. And the pressures of the world instead of getting in the book and being filled with the spirit of understanding. Now watch. Verse 13. Till. We all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a what? Do you know how what happens with these two, the saints? They first trusted. And the faithful, when they start hearing the truth, what's he going to make? He's going to make one new man and when that one new man is finished fill all in all it'll leave and when it leaves then God will go right on with his program that he had without us are you alright understand he made one new man People who had ordinances and people that had no ordinances. They came together, but they had to be perfected. They had to be put together. Now watch, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. How do we endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit? Well, here's the unity of the Spirit, brother. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 13. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, I apologize. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For... By one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Oh my goodness. Hold that. Go back to Ephesians 4 and compare it. Let's see what the gifts are supposed to know here. Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 4. There is one body. Not two. Folks, these are not two bodies. There are two groups of people that are going into what? One body. How do they get in there? By the gospel of their salvation. Okay? Now watch. For there is one body, one spirit, even as you're called, and one hope of your calling. Well, wait a minute. Let's go back here. 1 Corinthians 12. For by one what? Read it with me. Spirit are we all baptized into one body, <clears throat> whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, have all been made to drink into one spirit. How would you get in the body? How'd you get in the body in a verse? By one spirit. We were what? Oh my goodness, it ain't water. Is it? Let's see, Ephesians again, chapter 4, uh, 1. Boy, this Ephesian letter is just crammed full of this stuff. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 12, that we should be the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, 
in whom you also trusted. Have you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation? What was it? Christ died for their sins. Most they didn't know it. And all of a sudden, God tells them, Christ died for our sins. Now watch the gospel of your salvation. In whom also had you believed you were, oh, praise God, what's the word? Sealed. How? How do I get that Holy Spirit promise? Ephesians chapter 3, verse 6. That the Gentiles, oh, I bet that's them faithful ones that ain't got no ordinances. I bet that's them faithful ones that nobody thinks they ought to be in the body because look at them. They eat anything they want. They do anything they want. And they walk around telling everybody they're forgiven. Look at verse 6. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs. Oh, my gosh. You mean to tell me you're an heir of God according to Romans 6? Oh, yeah, Romans 8, I mean, Romans 8, I apologize. You're an heir of God? Yes, I am. Well, what, did, what makes you think that you're an heir of God? Well, go back to chapter 1, verse 6 of 5. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children. Is the adoption of children making you an heir of God and joint heir with Christ? That's Romans 8. Okay, <clears throat> then I go back to chapter 3, Ephesians 3, 6. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs. You can't be a fellow heir unless somebody's there already. Those who first trusted were heirs, weren't they? But they got put ordinances on them because God was reaching in there and getting elect Jews all the time. And Jews require signs, tongues, and other things going on in the book of Acts. He didn't tell you to consider what Luke said. He said, consider what I say. Well, I can go to 1 Corinthians 13 and find out that tongues would cease. Now watch again, Ephesians 3, 6. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs, same body. Why? There's only one. Right? Is there one body? And partakers of His promise in Christ. How? By the gospel. There ain't more than one gospel, folks. If they did... Paul's accursed. Though I or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to him, let him be accursed. Now, you know why I know that the gospel of Christ, 1 Corinthians 15, is the true gospel? Because it's hid to every cotton picking person around you. It is embarrassing when you ask even preachers what the gospel of their salvation is. And they can't take you there. You mean tell me you got up this morning, preacher, and didn't know where the gospel of Christ or didn't know what it was? Well, you tell them, Christ died for our sins according to Scripture. Was buried and rose again the third day. You say, I knew that. No, you didn't. You did not know that was your gospel. You believe that's what Christ did, but you believe you had to repent rededicate or dedicate you had to turn from your sins ask Jesus in your heart and live the godly life and if you sin you must confess your sins and if it gets so bad you need to re-repent or rededicate holy crap who's going to make it what if you're in the process of rededicating the rapture company he leaves you because you aren't rededicated yet Folks, the reason you leave is because you're sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise which you got because you didn't keep no ordinances, because you didn't have to keep no ordinances, because somebody actually rightly divided the word of truth for you. And you understand that God forgave you of all trespasses and that through His blood you had redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Colossians chapter 1 verse 14. And that you didn't need to pray or expect the kingdom to come because you've already been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. The Colossian letter verse 12, uh, for chapter 1 verse 13. Don't you understand what them prison epistles are, how important they are in your life? Study them, study them. Study Ephesians and Colossians. Study them hard. Read them over and over again. Ask the Lord for absolute Lord, don't let me put anything into them. Let me see what it says and give me that peace. Amen.
I didn't do what I was going to do, but oh well. I appreciate you being here today.